In the previous lesson, we talked about osmosis and how water always travels towards the hypertonic environment because there's less water there across the semipermeable membrane. This happens regularly in animals and plants. So here are two examples. We have along the top line here an animal cell. The typical animal cell that they often mention is about a blood cell, but this would happen with any animal cell that only has, uh, or any cell that just has a cell membrane. So this is just a very typical example. If we start in the middle, um, an isotonic solution, um, whether it says isotonic environment, it just means that the outside of the cell has the same concentration of water and solute as the inside of the cell. So it doesn't say that things don't move. Water is constantly going to come in and out at somewhat an equivalent rate. So therefore, the overall shape of this red blood cell wouldn't change. That's the normal or typical shape to a red blood cell, a little, a little concave um, indentation on the cell. If we look over to the right-hand side here, we have a hypertonic solution. And hypertonic just means, once again, that out here in the blue, there is more solute, or you can say that there is less water out here. When compared to the inside of the cell, the inside of the cell is going to have more water or less solute. So if there's more water here, less water here, water wants to travel out to where there's less of it. And therefore, what will happen to the overall size and shape of this cell is you're going to see a decrease in volume because water is exiting and thus it's going to shrivel up. Hypotonic solutions are the opposite where the outside of the cell in this blue area is going to have more water or less solute compared to the inside of the cell, which would have less water, um, or, sorry, say that right, sorry, out here, less solute, more water, um, in here, less water, more solute. So therefore, water is going to go into the cell, and with the influx of water, you're going to see an increase in volume. And if you never reach the equilibrium state, and it's going to keep trying till it does, the pressure that's put upon the cell membrane could actually be too much and exert an overall explosion but there's an official term for that. It's called the cell has been lysed, or the process is known as cytolysis. So you might see that as well. Okay, maybe I'll type that so you can get a spelling of cytolysis. So cytolysis. And that's what happens in animal cells. Plant cells are a little bit different because they have different structures. The plant cell has a cell wall and a cell membrane. The only other structures drawn in this picture are going to be the central vacuole and the nucleus. I'm going to show you a different picture just because I want to highlight a little bit different than what I think they did here. Um, let me go forward. Sorry, there it is. So here's our picture, the same idea. I'm going to start with isotonic and what you can see around the perimeter here in a very structured way is your cell wall. Inside of that is the cell membrane. And then this is our central vacuole. In my picture, I didn't draw the nucleus. I didn't feel it was necessary. But the rest of this green is all the other organelles that a plant would have. But overwhelmingly, the color would be green because of all the chloroplasts that a plant contains. In an isotonic state, what you're once again going to have are water molecules going in and out of this cell in pretty much an equal rate so that the overall size of this cell is not going to change. If we then go to a hypotonic environment, the environment has more water than the inside of the cell. So therefore, the direction of movement of water is going to be into the central vacuole. And that's why you're going to see an, a change in size. Look at this one compared to the isotonic vacuole. This is going to increase in size. But there's no room for this green stuff to go. So what starts to happen is everything starts to get pushed up against the cell wall. The cell wall doesn't move because it's very, very rigid because it has that cellulose component. So now look at the cell membrane and cell wall. They're basically right up next to each other with very little space whatsoever. This arrow signifies the pressure that builds up and that pressure has a specific name and I'll type that as well. It's called Turger pressure. Or one might say the cell has high turgidity. So that's just another way to say it or it's turgid all representing the same base of T-U-R-G in there. So don't get confused if you see different variations of that word. This is going to be beneficial to a plant because plants don't have a skeletal system. When you have a plant that has millions upon millions of these cells backed up side by side on top of each other, that kind of builds a strong, um, a strong base so it can actually stand tall. And that's how a plant would survive going up. But what will happen is if you 
lack water, here's what happens in a hypertonic environment. You kind of lose that pressure because in a hypertonic environment, the water is going to want to leave the vacuole, hence the smaller size here. So it condenses, gets a lot smaller. Therefore, the cell membrane shrinks as well. This shrivels just like it would within an animal cell because this membrane basically acts the same way, regardless if it's an animal or plant, because it's the same structure. The cell wall doesn't, so the size of this hasn't changed. The vacuole shrinks, the cell membrane has to shrink away and condense itself, and now all this space starts to form between the cell wall and cell membrane because there's nothing there. There's no organelles between these two. And what would happen is if a plant lacks water, then the turgidity of the plant cells becomes very small and they don't have that support mechanism anymore. And that's why a plant might wilt or kind of tip over because that pressure no longer keeps it upright. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to show you was just a scenario of adaptation. So here you have an example of an amoeba. An amoeba is a single celled eukaryote. So it has a nucleus not drawn here, but it also is living in fresh water. And fresh water, we're not going to say is 100% water. I'm sure there's other things that are dissolved in it. So let's, for argument's sake, say it's 98% water. So out here in this space that I'm going to kind of highlight, this, sorry, I didn't change that color correctly, this water, hence the blue color, this water is highly water-based, very little solute. So we're going to kind of say this is the hypotonic environment. The cell is now hypertonic, so it has less water, so therefore the movement of this, the movement of the water is going to be into the, the amoeba. The amoeba will never reach isotonic state. It's never going to reach 98%. So what would happen is the potential that this cell could explode could go through cytolysis. So how does it survive in fresh water? It has a very special organelle that no other um, cells that we've talked about have. It's called a contractile vacuole. Once again, I'll type that. Contractile vacuole. As the name suggests, it has the ability to contract. Why would it want to contract? When water comes into this amoeba, it gets stored into the contractile vacuole. Before it would go through cytolysis, it then squeezes its vacuole and all the excess water is then released. So it prevents the whole cell membrane from exploding. It's just a mechanism to survive in an, a very truly hypotonic environment. So that's an adaptation. Um, there are some real world applications to this. This is one of those. I talked about the, the plant life shriveling. Um, another example of plant life and how it can be affected by hypotonic. If you think of celery, celery in a very hypertonic environment would be very flimsy. In a hypotonic environment, it has a lot of uh, turgidity to it, so therefore it's very non-pliable and it's very stiff and crisp. So that's why some people, when they order or get celery from the grocery store, they immediately come home and put it into water, in very tap water, even so would be classified as hypotonic probably to celery. And therefore the water would go in and kind of create this and the celery stays crisp. And everybody likes crisp celery. They don't want flaccid or, or flimsy um, celery. So that lesson, it was just talking about how we have to adapt to osmosis. And those were some real life examples of how osmosis affects your everyday life.